All right, everyone, welcome again to the Faces of Business. I'm your host, Damon Pastalka, and with me today, I've got Tyler Jeffco from Seller Accountant. Tyler, welcome. Thanks, Damon. I appreciate you having me today, man. Oh, man, I am excited. I am excited because, A, you work in the world of e-commerce and you work with numbers, so that's my world. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're like strange kindred spirits from across the country here, right? So. Yeah. Yeah, only I went to school for engineering, which has nothing to do with accounting. So, but the the thing that's cool, man, is is that uh, you know you're helping e-commerce companies solve the accounting challenge. And I think when we look at e-commerce, uh, the accounting challenges for e-commerce and the solutions, uh, it's it's always interesting to talk to an expert like you that that has is in there doing it. Well, thank you, man. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, we talked about this for a second in, in the past, but the data sets coming out of these e-commerce uh, platforms, marketplaces, sales channels are are just complex and hairy enough that something like 99.9% .9 of accountants in the world hate it, right? They, they want to avoid it like a fiery passion. And that's all we do at Seller Account. We decided let's just niche in here. It's funny, you're talking about engineering and now you're kind of in the M&A helping people exit space. You know, my the first company I built was a healthcare company. So I'm, I'm an accountant with a finance MBA that decided let's build a healthcare company and exited that a few years ago and then started this, this brand, Seller Accountant. And I'm kind of back home where I've actually have some ability to add more value than go help that person. You know, so, yeah, so yeah. it's been a good pivot back into my education, honestly. Well, let's just talk about that a little bit. Tell us about your background. I mean, you you got an interesting background. You bought, you built a company, sold a company, but just give us some history here and, and then how you kind of ended up doing what you're doing today. Yes. I mean, the, the quick story is I'm, I'm, I'm here in Georgia. You know, the uh, the other, was it UGA, the, the the Harvard of the SEC or something like that? It's actually <laughs> not true, but yeah, studied accounting. I was not a traditional accountant. I like, uh, I like people a lot more than your traditional accountant does. And Ended up starting, uh, joining a startup to build a, a home healthcare model. Uh, a few years, uh, went back to grad school and kind of launched it out of the MBA program at Georgia. And we had a good run, zero to you know about a hundred employees in about four years. And yeah, man, it was more than I wanted to manage as a CEO. I was not, um, I was, I was outside of outside of my gift blend because I'm I'm more of a visionary sales guy. And what we really needed in that company was a manager, somebody who could. Yeah hold people's feet to the fire. And so we sold the company and it has since I found out last year, Damon sold again to a national franchise. So the, the concept that we built from scratch, literally we had a focus group of, of 30 people in a room that helped us build the brand and the essence of our company. That concept is now officially gone from birth to death. It doesn't exist anymore. And um, so it's kind of an interesting moment. So, so I sold that company into 2017, started seller accountant because I'm an e-commerce junkie. I was kind of a, yeah, eBay, scrappy eBay seller guy. Even when I was in college, uh, I hate to say it. I don't. I'm not proud of this, but Bezos does control my life. I get everything on Amazon, right? I work. Yeah, yeah. And so, building a company that kind of niches into e-commerce was pretty natural. I don't know much else, so we did finance. Yeah, yeah. Huh. That's cool. So, are your sellers primarily somebody that's going to be on an Amazon only platform, or are they on multiple platforms? No, yeah. So it's it's for us the niche is e-commerce. So they for the the clients they're going to choose to to pay for kind of a higher level of accounting are normally not your kind of old school retail arbitrage sellers. We're, we're we're normally having some connection to the brand, whether it's private label or we may even have some manufacturing shops, Damon, like some of your clients do. Yeah. And and beyond that, we it's not that there's zero bricks and mortar. Some of our clients do have some traditional wholesale accounts. But that's not the bread and butter of their business. Our core customer is, you know, has an Amazon or other marketplace strategy, maybe yeah. Walmart, Wayfair, and the like. And then they also yeah. have a, a clear direct to consumer strategy executed through Shopify, WooCommerce, and that kind of thing. Okay. Okay. So they are on the your your clients are on multiple platforms. That's right. Trying to trying to hit everybody everywhere. Yeah, and that's kind of the challenge, right? Is how do you manage your precious resources to know how many buckets should I stick my feet into, right? I mean, I think that's really been an interesting challenge for our, especially the CFO clients. So the half of our business that I'm most involved in is really kind of a CFO advisory service for these brands. Yeah. And um, yeah, and it's interesting because Amazon is an entirely different animal than Shopify, right? The funnel's different, the expenses are different profitability is different and some products are never going to make it on a Shopify site. 
doesn't yeah. matter how good you are at advertising. And some products are never going to make you any money on Amazon because the fee structure is too high. And so just understanding your product market mix uh, and kind of having a coherent, I think it's something I've heard you say even before, Damon, is having a coherent strategy for your catalog yeah. is kind of, this is paramount. You got to have that. And so that's kind of one of our roles is to help our clients develop yeah. and implement that strategy. Yeah. Well, the, the, I tell you the e-commerce space, I'll just call it that in the last 18 months has gone through so many changes because of, you know, the COVID induced buying frenzy for lack of a better term uh, on, on just about every e-commerce seller that, you know, is not selling something that, you know, isn't in demand, which I, I, I'm sure there are things, but not very many because just about everything else I can think of that is sold with e-commerce has been in high demand. And uh, it's nuts. Everything from, you know, new companies popping up to valuations on buying companies to all kinds of things. So just overall, what are some of the interesting things you've seen or some challenges you've seen in your work in the last year? Yeah, so I think, I mean, thinking about it from the brand's perspective, you're exactly right. I mean, I, I would say 80% of our customers had a great 2020 because of the, the COVID bump. The, yeah. Um, they, we saw a macro acceleration towards e-commerce buyer behavior. That's, that's one way to say it. In other words, there you uh, go. grandma used to go to Kohl's. Kohl's was harder to get to. She finally bit the bullet and set up that Amazon account or, or finally had the guts to put her credit card into a website. And so the adoption that was already happening, that the curve was already heading in the e-commerce direction, we probably saw three or four years worth of acceleration in that curve last year for a lot of our brands. Uh, it, but you mentioned this, the other 20% of the brand had a really terrible year, right? I mean, they were selling something related to travel. Uh, in fact, I was on a yeah. phone call with a- Yeah, there you go. Yeah, something like, I, I was on a call with a guy earlier, multi-million dollar brand, really nice set of products. He's not gone, he's in good shape. But boy, did he take it on the chin last year because he's selling products that are often purchased in preparation for business travel or something of that effect. And and so what's really interesting, I don't know if you've seen this also, Damon, but now that we're on the kind of on the back end, I'm not saying we're on the back end of the pandemic, but we're on the back end of the main noisiness, the clients that had the best summer in 2020 are seeing a, a de-escalation in their growth. There was almost an anti-COVID bump that happened here in July, where I would say half of my clients had a pretty poor month last month. So we're, we're sitting here talking here in August, and it's because of two reasons they had a poor month. And this is to kind of get to your question about challenges. One is we were arbitrarily inflated last July, and we needed to come back down to earth. There's a little yeah, bit of gap. Yeah. And then the second thing is getting a getting a damn container out of China right now is yeah. three times what it would have costed my clients a year ago. And and so those products are just flowing through to their P&Ls now, right? So all of a sudden you get to July and that container that used to cost me $8,000 cost me $22,000. That's finally hitting yeah. my profit and loss and is creating some compression and margins, um, you know, for the most recent months. You're right. And, and I just had someone on, um, I don't know, last week or the week before, or a couple of weeks ago that was talking about that very thing, container costs from China, just like you said, and they're in Georgia too. It was like eight to 20,000 or some guard darn thing like that. It was just like, man, it's it, this is mind boggling because when you look at, and that's just container cost, right? So yep. when you look at it, if I have a hundred or two hundred, even two hundred thousand dollars worth of product in that container, that's still I just added a lot of percent points onto my cost of my product. Yep. And you can't just go out across the board on everything and raise prices. Yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, the, the elasticity for our customers, the downstream customers, never seems to match what. Um, Actually, you mind if I show you a quick illustration? I found. No, out let's see it. Let's see it. Right, you guys are gonna love this. So let me see. I'm if I pretty can sure you can your, share your screen. Let's do this one. Okay. So I'm gonna um, put it in. We'll see it now. There, there we go. It is. Okay. So I just went. This is just a Google search. I, I wanted to take a minute and let's have a pause. You know, Bezos's wealth over the last 12 months only increased by four percent, which results in about $8 billion. <laughs> he, may, he may not be able to feed his children. Things are really hard for him right now. I mean, you see how yeah. he underperformed the S&P 500 by a pretty large margin. But 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 I don't know if you ever heard of these guys here. Let me, let me get over here. Have you ever heard of these guys right here? Yeah, I these have. These guys had a very good year. Oh, my goodness. Like, 
<laughs> so the same chart here where you're looking at poor Bezos down there at the bottom, the S&P, which had a 32.5% year, and now you've got Merck that is that is more than doubled over the yeah. last 12 months. Um, so do you think they've actually had their cost go up? I don't think so. I think they were able to, to gouge the system here a little bit. But I just yeah. I'll show you some other stuff here in a little bit. But I just I thought that was so interesting. Those guys are um, they're winning. And, and here's what they got to be careful of, by the way. If I'm Merck, I got to be a little bit careful because Bezos does have a track record of like retaliatory vertical integration. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And there's, and that's someone that's got enough money to do it. Right. You know, it was uh, spaceships, it was trucks. Next thing you know, they already have ships. It's not like Amazon doesn't already have uh, yeah. uh, freight ships, but you might be surprised over the next two years to see all of a sudden Amazon has bought 17 additional container ships or, or that kind of thing. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah so well, I mean, they're, they're, they're ensuring their long-term success by making sure up and downstream that they're, they're, they control it, if nothing else. And even if they don't eventually own it one day, they'll they'll have a lot of the, if they start it and do that, they're going to be owning it. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So that's yeah. good. But the, so container costs, they're hitting them now. We're, we're seeing a, a lull in July, but are your clients generally optimistic about the outlook? Yeah, I think so. There's a little bit of trepidation. I don't know if you've seen this with your customers, Damon, but we, so just from an exit standpoint, because out of our portfolio, we've, we've had, I think, close to 10 of our clients be acquired in the last year. Lots of mm -hmm. cash flooding into the space with the aggregator funds and that kind of thing. And, and a few of these clients have had just slam dunk, very high multiple, like yeah. obscene kind of exits, really, 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 really nice exits. And a few of those are still happening. But there is a little bit of rising concern because of not just the um, supply chain pressure that I mentioned, but also some pressure on, on advertising uh, have, has just compressed margins a little bit. And so we've seen a little bit more of the, you know, kind of one to $20 million brand owner saying, OK, I either need to exit now or I'm going to probably wait nine months and try to get through another Q4 and try to see if the supply chain can normalize for me a little bit because I'm a little worried I'm going to get whipped if I go to market right now, because the, the smart money is trying to get smarter. I'm not sure that much of it was very smart a year ago. It was just throwing cash at, at, at portfolios. Um, so that's the other thing I'm seeing is I think there is a, a time everyone's for the most part bullish. Amazon's not going anywhere. Shopify is for sure not going anywhere. But I think if it was, there's never been a golder time to sell that may have been two months ago or maybe mm -hmm. in six months, like maybe right at the beginning of the year. And unless you happen to be one of the favorite brands that really saw double digit plus growth still even through um, through July and August. And then there's so much money that's clamoring for your brand. If that's you, that you may want to consider going a little bit more quickly. That is a good, that is a good point. And, and I think, I think you're right that that it was going so hot for the you know the the end of 2020 and into 2021 that the money rushed in and I mean how many places now if you go to the several of these aggregators they're still saying hey we'll buy your business in 60 days or 90 days and and you know they they've got it worked out to bing bang boom if you're that right size and and uh, you know especially if you're if you got a few products, multi-million dollar brand on FBA, that's like a, it's a no brainer for them anymore. Yeah. It's kind of changed the the strategy a little bit. I mean, Damon, if you and I were talking 18 months ago, every strategist in the country would say, please diversify as quickly as possible. Yeah. Let's, let's get off Amazon. Let's find ways to diversify. And, and then let's, and here's my magic word, kind of as a, a my number, a rule of thumb as a CFO was let's try to get some other channel above 15%. Because yeah. then we are actually articulating a lowering of the risk profile when you go to market and try to sell this thing. But in the last 12 months, it's been completely cuckoo, Damon. It's like yeah. if we can get four SKUs, each doing a million a year in revenue, only on Amazon.com, we want two VAs, we want no infrastructure, please don't have a warehouse, and partridge in a pear tree. Right? It's like just so simple, streamlined, um, that... That almost, first of all, it's exactly where the market is right now because these aggregator funds are private equity that doesn't know how to operate the business yet. And so they're having yeah. to do things that are as simple as possible. I think my concern or maybe my, my advice to someone that isn't going to go to market right away is don't forget that common sense normally 
still catches up to the market, right? And yeah, so yeah. If you have more than a six to 12 month timeline, now might be a great opportunity to start investing in those other channels again and try to have an offering that's going to be more palatable for a bigger acquirer maybe in a few Yeah. Years. Yeah. Well, and, and you're right. I was, I was really surprised when I started hearing years, a couple of years ago now, when they started putting money into the aggregators and then they really gained steam last year, like amazing steam, but um, that they would buy a company that is completely tied to Amazon. And, you know, because in that respect, that goes against everything that the M&A industry has talked about for years and private equity and investment. It's diversify your risk, diversify your risk, diversify your customer base. I can't tell you how many deals I've been in and they go, oh, too much customer risk because you've got, you know, more than 50% in one customer. Right. And it's like now they're it's just like through caution to the wind on the Amazon platform. Yeah, I mean, I think the this the the private equity market has decided to trust Amazon's staying power. I think that's really what's happened over the last eighteen. That's a good months. way to say it. Yeah, and I think what everyone's waiting for right now, and you guys need to keep an eye on this over the next couple of months, is one of the larger aggregators, Thrast.io, Thrasio, is likely to have some form of an IPO, probably with a SPAC here in the next two months. Yep. And I think how the public markets kind of respond to the full kimono financials of a firm like Thrasio um, is going to have a pretty significant impact on how much pucker versus additional private equity enters the space. So yeah, uh, there was another firm, I think they changed their name. It was Mohawk. Maybe they became Tyrion that, that really got crushed last month because they were, they were a public company that didn't earn what they had, what they had forecasted. And so I think Thrasio is much, much healthier than that company. Uh, but we're all kind of waiting here saying, okay, is another six, 10, $20 billion in capital going to flood the space? If Thrasio gets treated like Cinderella next month, the answer is yes. Yeah. If Thrasio then in three months has to release a true Q3 earnings or whatever the, whatever the, the case might be. And the public markets say, we don't buy this thesis that you can be very Amazon centric. We're going to see a lot of puckering happening, yeah. <laughs> a lot yeah. of cash trying to figure out what they're going to do. And so anyway, for guys like you and me, it's just kind of like, wow, I'm just kind of excited to get to see what happens. Yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, this this space for me is has been so interesting, for, yeah. really, for the past five years. But I think that the last, like you said, last year accelerated three, four years in one year. Um, the, the buying, the types of buying, the way people are buying, the way companies are solving buying, you know, making it easier for customers. I mean, just the, uh, five years ago, you never thought about going to Home Depot, having your products ordered and pull up and them and, and just rolling it to your car or them bringing it out to you. Now that's, I mean, how many people shop like that now? It's when you have to go. Yeah, I'm about to, I, I have gotten lazier. Like, I, I don't feel great about this, but it's like so easy now to either just buy it on Amazon or be like, I mean, I'm a able-bodied. I'm in my late 30s. It is not that hard for me to walk into Home Depot and, and buy the damn shovel, right? But like now I'm like, well, hell, don't, don't put it in my car for me. I mean, I guess I'll sit out here and listen to my podcast and let them do the work for me. I mean, it's yeah. your, to your point, Damon, it's amazing how quickly that buyer behavior. And so this is maybe my point to anyone who listens to this, that phenomenon isn't going away, right? The idea that buyer behavior is going to continue bending towards e-commerce, regardless of what might happen to Thrasio or Amazon yeah. or, Merck or anyone else, not going to. It's not changing. And, and, and I tell you what, the big box stores and Home Depot is one of them, I think, that mm -hmm. realize this and embrace this before 2020. They I mean, they were starting this early and mm -hmm. a lot of other people had to catch up. But you're 100 percent right now. You think of the convenience that just that Home Depot and for someone like me, where I've, if I've got people working on my yard or, or my son when he's home from college, I got working on a project. I sit here and I'm like, boom, you got a project this afternoon. Just go pick up the stuff. <laughs> you know, and how good is that? Yeah, I mean, this true. kind of thing that we can do now. And you look at, I look at people that I know now, my mother's in her 70s, doesn't go to the grocery store anymore. She, she has it delivered. It's like, why? I don't need to go to the grocery store anymore. I don't, I, and part of it, it started because they didn't want the risk, but right. then now it's like, Hey, we like this. Yeah. Was it five bucks for them to deliver it? Let's yeah, do it. it's so crazy like that. Yeah. Or they or they do the, the the drive up and they put the bags in your back like in the back of the car like that. So this kind of stuff, I think, 
has driven a a uh, change in buying habits that have moved us so far ahead, like you said, three, four, five years ahead, that e-commerce to me is this playground because now we're trying to figure out what what crazy things can we add e-commerce to? And especially in, in the manufacturing and e-commerce world where, where I work a lot, where we're talking about being able to do things like, I, I just saw an article the other day, or not an article, but I was on Instagram and an ad popped up for a, a sheet metal fabrication company in, I think it was in Nevada. Huh. Send us your file with these specifications and we will give you an instant quote off of it. Amazing. So how, how the configurator like that, that understands what you're giving them and, and a completed assembly, they were or, or completed component, they were going to give you a quote like that. These are things that we would have looked at years ago and just said, you're crazy, move on. Yep. But now the Amazon culture, and I shouldn't say Amazon culture, but the 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 per the infiltration of Amazon into all of our lives yep. has has set the expectations like that for everything. It's and true. you're gonna, I think you're gonna be looking at companies that are like you just pick one, Merck, Smith and Nephew medical companies, whatever companies you want to talk about, Caterpillar, it doesn't matter what it is. People are going to expect to be able to get on. I've got, you know, a thousand pieces of construction equipment and the head maintenance buyer is going to expect to get on to Caterpillar and order every damn thing they want online and not talk to anybody, not go to a distributor, not do anything and have it show up. And then the step further becomes, then they're going to demand an API integration where yep. it's just real time. And so, yeah, it's so interesting. Dan. I, mean, <laughs> there's, I mean, that's so it's if you could somehow take a whiteboard, I got one behind me here. But like if, if we could take a whiteboard, and I would encourage you guys to do this for any products that you're manufacturing or private labeling or acquiring is really plot each of the points in the value stream. Yeah, I think what you need to realize is that the pressure is for it to be a simpler, smaller supply chain where there yep. are less middlemen, less stops on the value journey, and that there is pressure not only in consolidating the number of kind of squares in that flow chart, but in consolidating the speed with which that flow chart needs to be able to spin. So like theoretically, if I was if I was manufacturing this old UGA cup here, I need to be thinking, okay, what are the actual stops? I have a freight forwarder, I've got a factory, I've got this, I've got this, I've got this. And I now have to be thinking three years in the future, half of those middle entities aren't going to exist. Am I one of them? Because if I am, I need to do something different. I need to do it really quickly to pivot the way that I'm delivering my products so that I can accomplish the what you're talking about, where now we can use technology to order something that quickly and have it be maybe customized. And, and so it's going to be wow. interesting to see. Um, this is another part of this going to be interesting is to see if anyone else can figure out manufacturing the way China has. I mean, there's, I've got guys that are working heavily in Vietnam and Laos, and I've even got some guys working heavily in Mexico right now. No one's figured it out yet, right? I mean, it's, a, it's, it's China's still king and they're like 17 years ahead, it seems like. But I think in technology years, we're going to see some additional pressure to whether it's 3D printing or whether it's something else to make more of a, I mean, think about that, that Nevada company you're talking about, their ability to take what's probably a CNC router based steel yes. cutting system and basically pull a software piece where they got a guy at a table yeah. who's like, here's the next one. It's round. Let me cut it. Here's the next one. It's triangle. Let me cut it. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah. 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 And th th it is. And when you think about it, you're you're exactly right. I think this is going to be the the demand yep. is faster compressing that supply chain and customization. That's right. And one of yes, there's always going to be some standard products, but when you look at companies, well, one here we know kind of what this this company comes from, where yep. it comes from, and even they customize their stuff now. And in, in it, these are the kind of things that I think people are going to want. And I think there's an opportunity here, too. This is where domestic producers of mm -hmm. more premium products Agreed. can really stand out. Because like that company I was talking about in Nevada, they if they can instantly quote something and then produce it, say, in three days, 
you can get it back out to somebody in say seven days. Now, now we're talking because yeah. I, I actually was talking with a cl- with a client about this last week, and they're in they're in a in in, in an industry and have uh, domestic production that this would mm-hmm. make a difference. And I said, what if you could customize color combination, right. size, whatever it is that you're working on, and customize you know someone's name on it or whatever you want to do, and do it in three days. Instead of instead of this this whole production being okay, we want to get some volume on different kinds of products, blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. Let's let's figure out how to get volume, but let's figure out how to customize each one. Right. And and the what that does, the speed, the the value of that speed. I mean, big companies have been doing it forever. And here in Seattle, we have pack car, they build semis, right? They've been the semi trucks. Each one of them is com- can be completely different from the one right behind it. You can do it if you figure it out. Yep. So when we can put these into more everyday products that are consumer based or like you said, even B2B based, hmm. that's going to be something. Yeah, it'd be really cool. I think that's probably where things are headed. I, I, I think you're exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. But you, like you said, it's going to take there's going to be people in the middle, I think, that are going to sque- squeezed out from it. But what else are you seeing that's interesting, man? Because we're we're you're off to talk to where are you going to be talking at? You said you're talking like this week at well, I so so there's a conference coming up in a few weeks called Resonate. Uh, they're going virtual this year. So I was I was I was live in Vegas a couple months ago at, at Prosper, but this is Resonate's a good show. It used to be live in Atlanta. Now we're gonna be doing nice. remote. And then I'm I'm speaking, you know, I mean you and I do the same thing, tour the the masterminds and the podcast and yeah, just try to figure out. So I, I guess a couple of interesting uh, I'll do them one at a time in case we run out of time. We can, if we run out of time, we can, we can look at it later, but here is. All right. I'll put her back on screen here. All right. So seller account is trying to do a better job of keeping up with, you know, kind of what's happening in data sets across, uh, across e-commerce. So taking real, right. You go to a conference, you go to a cocktail party, everyone wants to talk about their sales, sales or vanity. What are they really doing in terms of profitability? And I'm an accountant, so this illustration is awful, but I wanted to show you what Q1 profitability looked like relative to Q2. Uh, and the the top left-hand corner, the kind of darker brown, that's the profit, that's PAG, post-advertising gross profit. So as a, as a CFO in the space, what I really care about is how can I have my after ad? So I'm thinking about cost of goods sold, logistics, marketplace or, or merchant fees, and then my advertising. What is the contribution margin of my portfolio? Yeah. And that's the the circle, the red circle. I want it to be as high as possible. And then everything else that might be on my PL is just overhead. I want to keep it as low as possible, right? That's the game. And so just stopping at that PAG line, post advertising gross profit, you can see that we had a better Q1 than Q2. And the differences are, are obvious. That tripling of the containers I talked about a few minutes ago is finally starting to hit those PLs. And so we saw the landed cost to get sold factor just go up by about five points wow. across a pretty large set of data. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, what do you do about it? I think what you do about it is you hold tight because I think the container log jam is going to come on log jammed here in the next few months. I think you're going to have to spend more on advertising. I think you're probably going to have to accept a slightly lower margin for a few months. Q4 is going to be great. But just if you felt like July was kind of crap, you weren't the only one. So let me, I just wanted to mention that. And really even before July, kind of in May going into June. The next thing I wanted to show you is this. um, This is like the way that a lot of, at least Amazon sellers are feeling now with like this aggregator phenomenon. We feel like we're, we're playing against the Superman version of us all of a sudden. Like how are we going to compete with them? Yeah. And I guess... I just want to make you feel a little better for a second. So I'm just going to skip the, a slide here. This is the most recent quarter. And what I thought was so interesting is that the left-hand side over here, all of us are actually still performing a little bit better than the aggregators. So we're, it's close. We tend to be a little bit more efficient with our advertising. They haven't quite figured out how to advertise at scale yet. And we tend to be a little bit more efficient with our logistics because we're leaner operations. Yeah, and yet, it, and yet, if you were to look at the actual P and Ls for the aggregators, you're going to see a bottom line profitability of like 20 points because they don't have any overhead. They're able to slather that huge overhead across 100 million in sales, and that's made them. That's why you're going to continue to see more of this happening, more and more and more. Is that they are fundamentally there are some real economies of scale 
in being, you mentioned Home Depot, being Home Depot has its perks, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So anyway, I thought that was one thing I wanted to share, but do you have any comments or questions about that? No, I think that's awesome because people are listening might, might get, you know, like you said, you get intimidated by, mm -hmm. okay, now these, these five brands that I know and me may even be friends of yours because a lot of people know each other in the, in the industry. Mm -hmm. Right. So mm -hmm. they got bought by these aggregators and we used to be, you know, friendly competitors. Now I'm competing against a behemoth and I'm not ready to go yet. All right. For whatever reason, you know, this is great to understand that. And I think too, as you said, uh, I don't know if it, was, it might've been before we got on, we were talking about the aggregators. I think the aggregators honestly are going to find that they've spent a lot of money that maybe they shouldn't in a rush to invest. And that, that because of the fact that there's nobody that can deny that e-commerce has had a very nice run for the last 12 plus months. And a lot of these deals have got done, done in the last 12 months. And we'll see what the long-term play on some of these brands really is. It really is interesting that those those two phenomenon collided. It was it was because COVID accelerated e-commerce that the private equity world decided that this was a worthy venture. At the same time, you're exactly right in that there was a bit of a gold rush mentality and still is really where yeah, yeah. I think, and this is something you can speak to for your clients, very few of these e-commerce based deals have actually gotten paid all the way yet, right? Most of them yeah. have an earn out, stability. They need these guys to execute for another 24 months in order for them to get all of their money. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right. I think it's going to be, and so, but here's what it's going to mean. I do think there's still some advantages to first movers. So a lot of the early guys are going to do well. Yeah. Um, Purge, Heyday, Thrasio and the like, I think they're going to do pretty well. But then there's going to be a bunch of these medium small funds that are, already trying to find a Thrasio to buy them, already trying to find a heyday to buy them because they realized eh, actually running these businesses is a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. And yeah. so I don't know. It will be interesting to see what happens over the next few months. Yeah, def definitely will. But I think that the, you know, it's, it's great to get your perspective on it because there's a lot of, and like most, most industries, most businesses, business owners tend to tend to get up in the morning and look in the mirror and make decisions. That's yeah. who they really talk to a lot of times. And uh, it's great to get to hear your perspective on that. Awesome. Awesome. Well, what else you got for us today, man? This is, I just, I'm in, like I said, you're talking to an engineer. <laughs> I, I love hearing this stuff. So what else we got going on? All right, let me give you one more kind of nugget here. This is going to be pretty actionable for your for our audience here. So I think if I were a million, $10 million brand right now, I'm going to really start focusing a little bit more on PAG, which I'll talk about a little bit, and on another metric called return on working capital, which I'll show you in a second. And I'm going to start focusing a little bit less on other vanity metrics like just sales growth or just cost of goods sold. And so yeah. if you look at this small case study, Amy and Brian both have brands. They're both a million a year in sales. They have the same cost structure for landing their product. Amy actually is a little bit less efficient in terms of her advertising and Amazon fees or, or, or whatever. It doesn't have to be Amazon. Maybe it's logistics. Maybe she has a yeah. piece of furniture. Maybe it's just harder to ship. Whatever it is, her profit margins after ads are 20%, whereas Brian is 30. The last 18 months has seen Brian, at least in the beginning, Brian was getting a higher valuation than Amy because Brian is more profitable. It makes sense. His profit margins are heavier. What we're starting to see, though, and I hope this slide shows up okay here, is yeah. they the investors are getting smarter. They're realizing that the amount of networking capital that I have to have tied up in this business asset actually matters a lot. And so when you look at the fact that on average over the course of a year, Amy has about a quarter of the inventory, yeah. which means she has to borrow a quarter of the money or invest her precious cash. And so now what you're doing is you're taking annual profit for Amy, 200,000 divided by, I only had to put 75,000 chips on the table. And as a result, my return, 200,000 divided by 75,000 is 2.67. It means for every dollar I borrow, bag, borrow, steal, and put in the business, I'm getting a benefit of 267 a year. Yeah. 
Yeah. Whereas Brian, who appears more profitable at first, is having to keep four times the inventory in his supply chain. And I'm not talking about units. I'm talking about dollars. Yeah. He probably has worse terms with his suppliers. He probably has a broader catalog of 50 different products when maybe Amy has four. I don't know what the actual difference is, but my argument and something that you guys should start looking at is that Amy's business is two and a half times better. And not only that, Brian's business is two and a half times riskier than yeah. Amy's because the amount of capital that he has to, has to risk is so much higher. Does that yeah. resonate? Does that make sense, Damon? Oh, it does. And actually, one of our larger clients that we were working with uh, a few years ago, this exact thing came up uh, because as the company grew, uh, the owners were not able to keep the return on working capital the same. And it should have been honestly yeah. should have been. And it was, it was because of logistical challenges. Uh, but the inventory grew at a much faster rate than it should have. And you, when they look at the working capital, it's all part of it. Yeah. And, and that's a big deal when you're, especially when you're doing, you know, 20, 30, $40 million deals, because that's yeah. a lot more money that they have to put down over the term to run the business. Yeah, so a couple of things here. One is both in both of these scenarios, you've got to have decent books, right? So obviously yeah. it's not bookkeeping, but you've got to be able to, you have to be able to answer these two questions. How much profit did I actually make on an accrual basis over some amount of time? And, and the second question is how much inventory did it actually take me to generate that profit? You got to be able to put your hands on those two variables. And yeah. then the second thing I'll mention here is if Amy was my CFO client, like I'm coaching Amy, I would say, Amy, your velocity is unbelievable. You're turning your inventory four times a year. I'm happy. This is great. Let's take the next quarter and focus on your advertising campaigns and on your assets that are going to help you get better yeah. return on ad spend because your margins are a little bit low. Whereas, and so this is for you guys that are watching this. If I'm Brian and I've got low velocity, I've got, then I'm going to say, Brian, PPC is doing great, buddy. You've got great margins in your products. I need you to get more at bats per year. Right now, you only get one at bat per year with every dollar you borrow. I need you to get more. And there's a couple of ways you might be able to get more. Obviously, renegotiating your supply chain. Guys, yep. for every week you can get your supplier to wait for you to pay them <laughs> is seven full days worth of your cash cycle that you get to keep. Yeah. Um, and so finding ways to restructure debt, finding ways to make sure you've got the right three PLs in place that you're, and I think you were saying this earlier, I think some of your prior episodes have been about supply chain. It matters. Oh Identify yeah. Identify what's broken in your supply chain. And you might be able to, if you're Brian, take a business that's kind of underperforming and turn it around pretty quickly by making eight or nine phone calls, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. And that, that supply chain, especially if you're, if you're someone that's importing products from China, there, there, there are a myriad of ways yeah. to adjust that to take that number from where you are looking at it from a one to maybe even a two, just yeah. with some adjustment That's right. and, and doing what you're doing and, and coordinating. And cause it is, it is a challenge. I mean, if you're, if you've got a, if you've got, just say you've got a hundred containers worth of product that's in flow, any given, you know, time, a day, day of the, of the year, it's a challenge to make sure that there's not, you know, you didn't just get 20 of them. Right. When you shouldn't, go, you should only got five, and especially when you figure the when and, and combat it with today now, it's even worse because they're yep. sitting in the water now and they're just stacking up on the other side. Well, a lot of that they want to get paid for the sitting yep. in the water, which is even worse because it's I can't even sell it if I want to. But no. those kind of herky jerks that happens, I mean, they're not they're not fifty thousand herky jerks. This is like seven hundred fifty thousand dollars hits. Yeah. And you didn't know. Yeah. And you're like, well, we knew it was on the water, but we didn't, you know, whatever happened and just hits all at once. It's like these kind of cash cash flow challenges, again, drives up the cost of running that business. Yeah. And and like you said, the ways that you can adjust that are are many and you have to look at it. Because the, the buyers are getting smarter. It's right. it's it's the same thing with selling a business. 30 years ago, 25 years ago. And I wasn't in it. I'm old as hell, but I wasn't doing it then. So when you look at that, people didn't have the data that they have today about valuation of business. It's simple things like this that become common knowledge over time. And, you know, these every buyer is going to get smarter as, as it goes on. And as business owners, we've got to get better at running these businesses. Agreed. Yeah.
That's so cool, man. I'm glad you sh- glad you showed that and talked about it because it is it is something, especially and and I mean when you look at it, a million dollar brand, it's it's a fair amount of money, it's a fair mm-hmm. amount of product, but there's a lot of million dollar brands on Amazon. Yeah. And if if the million dollar brands would do like you just said, look at where I'm really at and make the changes I need to, it it could make a significant difference. Really good. And for yeah. bonus credit, I think if they did that same math problem per product line. So what was the profit for my product divided by how much of that product I have to have tied up my capital in? And then it's kind of, I hate to say it, it's a bit of a survival of the fittest. Which products in my catalog are killing me right now? And those are going to have to be on probation for 90 days. And if they can't fix it, I'm going to have to cut them. And so I think yeah. I think as a brand manager that's dealing with the realities of our current supply chain and e-commerce environment, you have got to up your game when it comes to managing the, the, the catalog level, which is kind of what I showed you, and then the yeah. product level of your return on capital. Yeah, yeah, you make a great point. The catalog, and, and it's not adding to the catalog because everybody loves to add to the catalog, right? right. But taking it out, it's always that we, we can add new products like crazy, but let's take the ones out that aren't performing yeah. and and then just see what they are. Or, or even or even for that matter, figuring out where they could perform. I mean, because, mm-hmm. you know, I look at and this is I don't want to get too far off on a tangent, but oftentimes if I'm if I'm running a, a, a multi-category brand, mm-hmm. I am really strong in one category right. and I know because that's where I started. I know my pricing in that. And while I moved into an ancillary category, that's pretty good. Just take, take the something like uh, backyard stuff, right? Yep. Home, home outdoor furniture, right? You just do that. Mm-hmm. There's all these different pieces. Well, I might have been really good at the, the table and chair set up or something like that, but now I'm going to make, couches or I'm going to make right. rock, whatever it is. And it really good at, I know the margin on this. Well, we're just going to apply that margin over to this other product line, but that may be more competitive, less competitive. And really they, they miss out on sales because they go, well, it's not our normal margins and it's not selling. So it's no good, but maybe they needed to get a little more competitive. Maybe they needed to change the way, you know, there's just so many other things that could make those products good. And then it sits there and just languishes. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, almost every business I've ever worked with has at least one SKU that is killing them. And if you have enough good SKUs, you ignore it to your own peril. And so I think that's that yeah. point is extremely well said. I mean, there's a reason the Procter & Gamble has a separate brand management team for each of the brands, right? Because they have to specifically understand who the avatar of the buyer, what does she look like? What does she prefer? And I'm going to build my value offering, my pricing, my supply chain, my marketing strategy, everything around the customer. But to your point, I've had so many brands exactly like you just said, Damon, where they really figured out this customer, but they also like had a cat and wanted to make a cat product. And then all next thing you know, they're they're much, much less efficient at the second product than they were at the first. And, and again, it doesn't mean you don't expand. Expand. Just be ready to invest in understanding your segment a little bit better so you can be yeah. successful. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, man, I I just I enjoy talking to you because it's it's a geek out on this stuff, but you're such a good uh, source of knowledge for the industry and where people can really um, learn from what you're saying. So any any last thoughts that you know the the people that are looking at their e-commerce and going man my accounting is sure a mess what you know what are some things that that you know tips you could give them i mean i think if you can't answer the question within maybe 10 minutes of pulling up your accounting system how much money did i actually make last month versus the month prior, then I think at a bare minimum, it's time to take a second look at your books. Now, now if this is a hobby, if you're doing $10,000 a month in sales, treat it like a hobby. But as soon as yeah. it becomes a business, business, you know, biggest errors are the ones you guys have all heard of. Don't run your personal expenses through the business. Make sure it's clean and separate. At some point have, uh, are you still there, Damon? Yes, I am. Oh, yes, cool. I am. Video froze up. I'm like, okay. Annoyed. Okay. But, um, yeah. Make sure that you've got, um, you know, a dedicated credit card and yeah. just do the work to make sure that you can put a name on every dollar. I hate to say you could hire a bookkeeper. Obviously we do bookkeeping for e-commerce. We'd love to help yeah. you, but I think putting a name on every dollar and then as you get closer to that hundred thousand a month mark, 
it's time to implement a pretty decent inventory management cost of goods sold system yeah. that may require you to get a, an expert involved. And that's another area where we could potentially help you. But yeah. I just think it's one of those things. Listen, I'm a sales guy. I, I have an accounting degree. My MBA is in finance, but I'm fundamentally a people person. I don't like looking at spreadsheets all day long. Thank God my business partner and the team do. I think if I can force myself as an entrepreneur, I'm, I'm optimistic. The grass is always going to be greener tomorrow. If I can force myself to spend one hour a week taking a deep dive, look at my finances and forcing myself to follow the data and make choices based on the data instead of kind of being like, eh, it's probably fine. I'll, I'll check it later. If you'll just give an hour a week, I think yeah. you'll see significant improvement. And here's a great example of this. This is just for my business, right? I'm, I'm for the first time now, three and a half years into this business, measuring our sales funnel. Never did it before. Like how many leads actually come into the website? How many of those book a call? How many to convert to a client? And I was like, huh, we got two runs in this value chain that are broken. I would have never known that. I would have never been able to take action on fixing that for my company uh, until I could see it. And so I think for you, making sure you can see your numbers so that you can drive the ship better is, is kind of what hey. It's funny you say that because one of the first things we usually do with our clients is we implement a weekly performance dashboard where it's mm -hmm. super simple. But listen, we want to know the gross margin every week. And I want to know how my channels performed to the gross margin line. Yeah. And and it, it is it is so good just to get that. And then make sure, you're, like you said, make sure you're, you can figure out how you are on a monthly basis or, or whatever. But measuring that performance and taking that hour every week will make a big difference. Agreed. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Tyler, if someone wants to get, to, get a hold of you, what's the best way to do that? So a uh, seller accountant and kind of see it behind me, which way is it here? Here it is. Selleraccountant.com, selleraccountant.com. You can find us there. Nice. Any way you want to get a hold of us, you can do it through the website. And uh, yeah, Damon, thank you so much for having me, man. This has been great. Oh, it's, it's awesome. I'm so excited about it. Just being able to talk to you about it. And then you just blew it out of the water with the, the graphs and the, the uh, information. Just thanks so much. Hey, you're thanks. welcome, my friend. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. Thanks for joining us again for another Faces of Business. Hey, this week on Thursday, it's funny that we are talking about the things we are talking about because on Thursday, we have Christina Harrington from Gen Alpha. And what they do is they've got an e-commerce uh, system that's made to put on OEM manufacturers to help through the entire supply chain take out the catalogs at the distributors and repairs. It's going to be fun. And uh, we're going to talk about that. So thanks everyone for joining us. We'll be back again on Thursday.